All right, so let's jump into logic coverage. <clears throat> Sorry, I just have my, one of my screens got lost here. There we go. All right, so um, no, this is not input space coverage. It's logic coverage. Slide number two, title. Um, so here we are, we're talking about logic. We are going to be, um, we're gonna be pr primarily just talking about logic um, in relation to source code. Uh, it doesn't have, that's not the only place, but that's where we're gonna be putting our focus. So where do logic expressions come up? They can come up from lots of places, decisions and programs. That's the primary place we're gonna be grabbing logic coverage, um, you know, logic coverage examples out of, but that's not the only place. You could look at finite state machines or state charts. You can find logic statements there. Um, you can actually look in requirements or other documentation and you can extract logic coverage or you can extract logic expressions from lots of places. Um, so, you know, you go back to week, to or wherever we were and you know if the light is on and the valve is open then release the monster well we can we can extract logic um, expressions from that requirement statement or from that system description um, it's important to recognize that covering logic expressions is required by the Federal Aviation Administration of the US as well as Transport Canada, as well as the European Air Safety Administration, whose name I can't remember exactly, um, as well as Japan's Aviation Safety Administration um, and probably others. So for safety critical software, for, um, for safety critical flight software, there's a regulation out there, DO 178, there's a version B, there's a version C. Uh, that regulation requires using a specific kind of logic coverage that we'll be talking about this week. Um, so this is not just kind of a theoretical, wow, look at what those crazy test guys came up with. Um, you know, this is, this is a real thing that's required in a lot of different scenarios for safety critical software. So a couple of definitions to cover first. First, we have a predicate. A predicate is an expression, a logical expression that evaluates to a Boolean value, right? It evaluates to true or false. And a predicate can contain several things. It can contain a Boolean variable or one or more or function calls that have a Boolean return value. It can contain non-Boolean variables with relational operators, right? Less than, greater than, equal to. It can contain logical operators. Um, and it contain, and all of these things that it contains are clauses. And so a clause is a predicate that doesn't have a logical operator. So what we're actually doing here is we can have a clause, which can be a Boolean variable or non-Boolean with relational operators, and we can connect them with logical operators to make bigger predicates that contain individual clauses. So let's look at an example. Here we've got A is less than B or f of z and d or m blah 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 and so there are four this is a predicate there are four clauses in this predicate the first clause is a is less than b the second clause is this function call f of z then there's a boolean variable that's our third clause and our fourth clause is this relational expression between m n and o and those clauses are connected with logical operators and an or So quick glance at statistics. Um, there was a study done and I forget exactly what the reference is here. Uh, looked at 63 large open source programs. There were more than 400,000, so almost a half a million predicates. And it found that the vast majority, 80, 80, 88 and a half percent of those predicates contained only one clause. So they were simple tests, right? If X or if X, equals y, things like that. Um, a little less than 10% had two clauses, so they were connecting two things with ands, ors, or xors. 
Um, a little over 1% had three and less than 1% had four or more. So this is actually really good news because the more complex your predicates get, the harder they are to test. So the fact that in the real world, most clauses, excuse me, most predicates contain only one clause, um, that's actually good news from a testing perspective. So where do we get predicates from? I pretty much talked about this. Um, we are largely gonna focus on pulling predicates out of program source code. So we can use predicates to develop a model of the software. Um, we can use predicates to require tests to satisfy some combinations of those clauses. Um, so let's look at a couple of abbreviations that we're gonna use in, in the next couple of slides as we define some logic related, predicate related criteria. So we can have big P, that's a set of predicates. Small P is a predicate, one predicate in that set. Uh, big C is a set of clauses, the set of clauses in the entire set of predicates. C sub P is the set of clauses in a single predicate. And then small C is a clause out of the set of clauses. All right, it's actually pretty clear as we look at it. So first, let's start with the simplest possible thing. Let's start with predicate coverage. This is about as easy as we can get. Predicate coverage requires that for each predicate in the set of predicates, we have to have two test requirements. The predicate has to evaluate to true and the predicate has to evaluate to false. Seems pretty straightforward. And if those predicates come from conditions on graph edges. So if we think back to last week where we were doing, um, where we were doing graph testing and we had tests happening and those tests were, in the, you know, right, were represented in the edges, right? So we had a true branch and a false branch. Um, if we're getting predicates out of the source code um, in the same way that, we'd that we would model them in graphs by those two edges, then predicate coverage is equivalent to edge coverage because for every predicate, we needed to evaluate true, we needed to evaluate false. And so we're going to cover both those edges coming out of a node, coming out of a test node, right? That cover both of those conditions. So let's look at our example here. This is a slightly simplified version. I took out f of x just to kind of make it a little simpler um, so that there wasn't so much stuff going on. Um, but here's a slightly simplified predicate let's apply predicate coverage to it. So our predicate has to evaluate to true. So how do we make it evaluate to true? If I wanted to write a test that would do that, um, well, here's an example test case, right? I could set A to five and B to 10 and D to true and M, N and O to all one. And we do the math and it all works out or we do the logic, it all works out to true. Um, now that is only an example test case. I also have to make it evaluate to false. So I can pick some other set of values to have it evaluate to false. Now I wanna point out here, um, in the upper one, I have my third line here, I have true or true and true, but that's just an example. It could have been true or false and true, false or true and true, right? Any combination of values that result in the predicate being true is what we're after. I don't need every clause to be true. Um, of course, the exception is if they're all connected by and, then I do need every clause to be true in order for the predicate to be true. But generally speaking, I don't need, I don't care about the value of the predicates. I only care about the value Sorry, back up. I don't care about the value of the clauses. I only care about the overall value of the predicate in order to satisfy predicate coverage. So predicate coverage, okay, fine, good, um, but not particularly strong, right? It's, so that's, that's edge coverage and edge coverage isn't bad. But especially if I have more complex predicates made up of multiple clauses, you know, I might be feeling a little unsatisfied that predicate coverage is the best that I could do. It seems like maybe I could have a more strenuous, um, maybe have a more strenuous criterion that I could use. Predicate coverage doesn't require evaluation of all the clauses, right? So if I had something, or something, or something, or something, 
if I evaluate the first one and it's true, then the predicate's true. I don't even need to look at the rest of them, right? So, so in that case, the others don't even matter. That seems kind of fundamentally unsettling when I'm testing complex or safety critical software. So I could look at clause coverage. So in clause coverage, I have for every clause in the set of all of the clauses in the, the program that I'm testing or the unit that I'm testing, I have two requirements. The clause has to evaluate to true and the clause has to evaluate to false. That seems like it's a lot better. But does clause coverage subsume predicate coverage? Any thoughts? No, because you're not guaranteed that you're going to get a predicate that's true and false. Yeah, great. I wasn't sure if your no meant no, it doesn't, or no, there's no thoughts. Uh, right. So you're exactly correct. It does not subsume predicate coverage, because if we had A or B, um, I can satisfy this with true, false, and with false, true. But in either case, the predicate's been true. So it doesn't force me, even though I've tested the clauses individually to true and false, there's nothing in there that requires that the predicate also be true or false overall. So that, again, seems kind of bad. I, I don't feel, I intuitively don't feel like I've really gotten where I wanna be yet. So let's look at an example here. Um, so the clauses, each have to evaluate to true. So that's not that hard. Um, in this example, I'm going to evaluate them all to true at the same time. But as we saw in the last one, that's not necessarily the case. They don't have to all be true all at the same time. But for simplicity here, I could set A to five and B to 10 and M and O, right? And then I can make each of these clauses individually true. And then I could set each of these clauses individually false. However, I could mix this up any way I want, right? I could take, I could take this line here, the five and 10, I could move it down here. I could, I could swap those two. Uh, as long as each individual clause at some point is true and at some point is false, I've satisfied clause coverage. So we've got some real limitations here for both of these, right? Predicate coverage doesn't fully exercise all the clauses. Um, clause coverage doesn't always ensure predicate coverage, right? It doesn't force the predicates, the predicates to always be true and false. Uh, so, hmm, well, what am I gonna do? Well, I, I could simply test all combinations. And we've seen often enough so far along the way, right? There's usually an all combinations option, no matter what kind of testing we're doing, there's generally an all combinations option. So combinatorial coverage for each predicate, the test requirement contains it. The test requirements contain a requirement for the clauses in the predicate to evaluate to every possible combination of values. Okay, so that's conceptually simple, and it's complete. I mean, there's there's nothing beyond that I could do, right? I've done all I can do at that point, but it's very expensive because we end up with two to the n cases where n is the number of clauses. If we have one clause. It's two tests, right? That's easy enough. If we have two clauses, it's four tests. That's not too bad. If we have, you know, eight clauses, which admittedly, admittedly would be unusual, but if we had eight clauses, we suddenly now have this, you know, gigantic set of tests that we have to have to satisfy that. Um, so this has its, you know, this has its weaknesses like any of the all combinations approaches. Uh, but, Here's an example, right? So three clauses, A is less than B and D and M is greater than or equal N times O. We can satisfy that with this truth table. Um, and if you're not familiar with truth tables, you're gonna be seeing a lot of these this week and next week. Um, and basically we put the clauses across the top. We put the predicate to the right. We number the rows just kind of, you know, index, just index numbering. Um, and then, we go through all the different combinations. And typically what we're going to do here, um, we'll typically start off, start off with all true and then basically do in essence a binary countdown, right? And, and change the 
rightmost value to false and then move that to the left and then both of them, right? And so we're basically doing a binary countdown of, of trues to falses to populate the whole table. So, so far we kind of feel unsatisfied, right? We've got predicate coverage that has some things that it lacks, clause coverage that has some features that it lacks, all combinations clauses, which doesn't lack any features, but is awfully expensive. Is there a better way? Um, I'm sure you're thinking, well, I think there's a better way because it's only 538 um, <clears throat> and this goes all night. So yeah, sure, there's a better way. And testing literature has lots of suggestions and as usual, sometimes they're confusing and sometimes they're conflicting, but the general idea is straightforward. We wanna test each clause independently of the other clauses. But what do we really mean by that? So we can apply this idea of active clauses, right? If clause coverage has a weakness, right? The clause coverage weakness is that the values don't always make a difference. Um, so if we look at the case where in our example, every clause was true, right? Five was less than 10, that's true. Um, true is true. One is greater than or equal to one times one, right? So they're all true. If we change only one clause here, if we were to reach in here and change an arbitrary clause, only changing the last one matters. If I change the first one, if I change five is less than 10, if I change that to, you know, 10 is less than five, now it's false, but it's being ordered with true. So it doesn't matter. The result is still true. If I change true to false, it's being ordered with five is less than 10, which is true. So the result is true. Only the last one matters. So in this case, with these values, only that third clause does something called determining, determining the predicate, right? That's the only one that if I change just one, that's the only one that would cause the predicate to change. So we'd really like to, <clears throat> we'd really like to test the results of changing each clause under conditions where that clause determines the value of the predicate. So let's take another look at what we mean by determination or by when a clause determines the predicate. <clears throat> we're gonna select a clause in C, right? Or we're gonna, we're gonna collect a, select a clause in P, excuse me, in the predicate. We're gonna call that clause the major clause. What makes it the major clause? Nothing makes it the major clause. It's only the major clause because that's the one we've picked at the moment, right? So we're just identifying, okay, I'm gonna pick A is less than B, all right? Or that's, that's the one I wanna look at right now. So I'm gonna identify that as the major clause. And that major clause determines the predicate if and only if the values of all the remaining clauses, the minor clauses, are set such that changing the result of the major clause changes the predicate. And when that's true, then we also, we also would call the major clause active, all right? So if I can set up all the other clauses such that now they've got values so that if I change the major clause, the value of the predicate changes, then that clause is active and that clause determines the predicate. And those are two terms that are very, two synonymous terms, active and determines the predicate. <clears throat> so let's look at a couple examples. So if we've got P equals A or B, if we want B to determine the predicate, then we have to set A to false. If we want A to determine the predicate, then we have to set B to false. Because only in that condition, right, for A to determine the predicate, if B is true, then we'll change the value of A and the value of the predicate won't change. So we have to set B to false in order for A to determine the predicate or for A to be the active clause. If on the other hand, we've got P equals A and B, now the result is true, right? If we want B to determine the predicate, then A must be true. And if we want A to determine the predicate, then B must be true. And so our goal in testing is to find values for all those, um, to find values for all the minor clauses such that the major clause will determine the predicate. 
And then we're going to iterate through the clauses and select each one as the major clause and do it all again. So there's a family of criteria that formalize this and they're very similar, but they have some important differences. So let's go through these right now. No, let's go through them in another slide later. Because I have an active clause example for us. All right, so we've got P equals A or B. How are we going to determine when A is the active clause? So if we select A as the major clause, and all that means is, hey, I'm looking at A, I wanna be able to find a value for B such that when I change A, the predicate changes. So I'm gonna find these two rows in the truth table. Here, A is true, and we have some value for the predicate. We don't care what the value is. And here, A is false, and the value for the predicate has changed. Therefore, for A to be the active clause, B must be false because it's only for these two rows where B is false that changing A changes the predicate. Now I next wanna select B as the major clause. And so now I'm gonna to try to find rows where when I change B and nothing else, then the value of the predicate changes. So here's here are those two rows, right? Rows three, rows four. I change the value of B without changing the value of A and the value of the predicate changes. If I picked, for example, rows one and two. Rows one and two, I'm changing the value of B and I'm holding A constant, that's good, but the value of the predicate doesn't change. So A, or excuse me, B does not determine the predicate for those rows. It only determines the predicate for these rows where A is false. So how do we calculate when some clause determines the predicate? So it's easy in simple cases, right? We'll go back to this one, it's easy. We can look at the chart, right? We can look at the truth table and we can kind of manually search for rows. Okay, I wanna change, I wanna change A, I wanna hold B constant, I want the predicate to change. Pretty easy to find rows two and four in this example. But as we get larger, more complex predicates, that becomes more and more difficult to do. And so we have an actual mathematical approach to do this. Um, and so we've got a couple of definitions here. So P, C equals true. That's defined as the predicate P where every occurrence of clause C is replaced with the value true. And P, C equals false is defined as the predicate P where every value of clause C is replaced by false. And so if I want to find out the conditions under which some clause C determines the predicate, I wanna take the predicate PC equals true and PC equals false, and I want to exclusive or them together. And so then the result of that will tell me exactly the values that are needed in order for C to determine the predicate. And I know that's completely straightforward and everybody's got it like that, but just for fun, let's look at an example anyway. So given P equals A or B, right? Again, a pretty simple case here, but we'll start simple. It'll get complicated enough soon enough. So the conditions under which A will determine the predicate are the predicate with A set to true, XORed with the predicate with A set to false. So given that, let's work through it line by line. So we're gonna take A or B, we're gonna set A to true. So now we've got true or false, true or B, and we're gonna XOR it with false or B. And that ends up being true because true or B is true. XOR with B because false or B is B. And true or B XOR is not B. Um, you will get a little experience doing exclusive ORs and, and that last transformation where true X or B is not B, that will come, that will become obvious to you if it isn't quite obvious to you yet. So what does this tell us? It tells us that A determines the predicate when B is false, which is exactly what we found out on our charts a couple slides ago. <clears throat> 
let's take another example. We're looking at P equals A and B. Where does A determine the predicate? A determines the predicate when P with where P A equals true is XORed with P A equals false. So that'll be true and B, XORed with false and B. True and B is B. False and B is false. So P A is equal to B XORed with false. So A determines the predicate when B is true, which kind of makes intuitive sense to us and matches all the previous examples that we had. All right, now we got a little more complicated example. P equals A or B and C. All right, same process. P A equals P A set to true, X or with P with A set to false. So that's true or B and C, X or with false or B and C. True or B and C simplifies to true. False or B and C simplifies to B and C. True and B and C XOR with, sorry, true XOR with B and C simplifies to not B and C or not B or not C. Thus, A determines the predicate when B is false or when C is false. So, as I mentioned, for, for simpler cases, it can often be easier to look at a truth table. Um, and these two approaches are identical. It's just that as your, um, as your predicate gets more and more complicated, it becomes more and more um, unwieldy, right? Just, just more and more difficult to do with a truth table just because the size of the truth table grows so much. So here, we'll select A as the major clause. And then we want to choose values for B and C so that when we change A and only A, the value of the predicate changes. So if we look through this truth table, we can find that row two and row six. These are the cases where I change A and only A, right? B and C are held constant and the value of the predicate changes. So two and six, that's where A determines the predicate. So A determines the predicate when B is true and C is false. But wait, we're not actually done yet because there are other cases. So rows three and seven, I change the value of A, I hold B and C the same, and that also changes the value of the predicate. And we're actually not done yet because this pair of rows four and eight is another case where we change the value of A hold B and C constant and the value of the predicate changes. So now if we look at this collectively, right, where is where does A determine the predicate? Well, it determines it when B is true and C is false, or when B is false and C is true, or when B is false and C is false, or in other words, not B or not C right, when B is false or when C is false, which is exactly the answer that we got on the previous slide using the XOR method. Now we can look at this truth table and evaluate when does B determine the predicate? And so now we're looking for cases where we change the value of B and only the value of B and the value of the predicate changes. So here we've got rows five and seven, um, we change B, we leave everything else the same, nothing changes, um, and we don't have anywhere else. That's the only case. So B determines the predicate when A is false and C is true. Next, we're gonna look at C as the major clause. We're gonna pick C, we're gonna look for cases where we change C and nothing else, and the value of the predicate changes, and we find it here in rows five and six, and that's the only place we find it. So C determines the predicate when A is false and B is true. And instead of our color coded check marks, which work nicely, but eventually you start to run out of colors, um, it's also common to just note these things with like a cut with like a, a matching ID number, right? So what I'm saying here is that row two matches with row six 
and row three matches with row seven, and row four matches with row eight, right, and five and seven and five and six. So we're just kind of identifying those pairs. All right, so that leads us to active clause coverage. In active clause coverage, <clears throat> for each predicate in the set of predicates, and for each major clause, or really for each clause that we will iteratively select as the major clause, we want to choose minor clauses so that the major clause determines the predicate. And then we have two requirements. The determining clause, the major clause has to evaluate to true, and the major clause has to evaluate to false. And because the major clause determines the predicate, that will also force the value of the predicate to change. I don't know if it goes from true to false or from false to true, but it will change by definition. So there's this ambiguity here, right? Okay, so I am changing the minor clauses. I'm setting the minor clauses so that the major clause determines the value, but do I really need to keep all the minor clauses the same or don't I? Um, is it okay if I vary the minor clause? Uh, and this is a question that has really been um, a point of confusion in safety critical testing for years. Um, I'm gonna vary the major clause and is this okay or not? Am I also allowed to vary the minor clause or am I not allowed to vary the minor clause? So when faced with an ambiguity, what do we do? We come up with subcategories that deal with the ambiguity, right? So let's resolve that. And we can really resolve it into three different cases. The first case is, case is the minor clauses don't need to be the same. I don't care what they are. The second case is the minor clauses don't need to be the same and I can use them to force the predicate to become both true and false. And the third and most restrictive one is now, the minor clauses do need to be the same. So let's take a little bit of a dive into each of these. And the first is general active clause coverage. And in general active clause coverage, the minor clauses don't need to be the same. Now, this is a little bit confusing because first I have to take each major clause and I have to identify values for the minor clauses such that the major clause determines the predicate. But then when I'm selecting values for the, main, for the minor clauses, they don't need to remain the same anymore, right? That's, that's kind of a little unclear. I think an example is gonna shed a lot of light on that. The interesting thing is that it's possible to satisfy general active clause coverage without satisfying predicate coverage because there's no requirement in general active clause coverage that the predicate changes. We can also have correlated active clause coverage. In correlated active clause coverage, I can change the major clauses, uh, excuse me, I can change the minor clauses, but I must change them in such a way that the predicate evaluates to true and for one value of the major clause and to false for the other value of the major clause. This does subsume predicate coverage. Um, and this is a version of MCDC, not MDCD. Slide 34. MCDC is uh, Modified Condition Decision Coverage, and this is what appears in DO 178, and this is what the FAA uses. And it's a little bit vague about whether this is allowed or not. And so there was a 2001, basically, paper that came out from the FAA saying, no, this is really what we mean by MCDC. And they called this approach masking MCDC. Our last and most strict requirement is that the minor clauses do need to be the same. So I'm gonna find a case where my major clause determines the predicate 
And then I need to find a case where when I change that major clause, the value of the predicate changes, and I have to write a test such that all the minor clauses are held the same. This is unique cause MCDC, and this is the common, the common interpretation of what MCDC is. But the problem with this one is that it tends to lead to more infeasible test requirements. And that's not really surprising, right? We found this with, um, you know, with graph coverage too, right? When we required a direct tour, we tended to have more infeasible test requirements. If we allowed a side trip or a detour, we tended to be able to get more feasible test requirements. All right, so how do those compare? This is a handy chart. You'll want to keep this chart around for quizzes and the final exam because this tells you everything you need to know about how those three criterion differ. In every case, we have to have <clears throat> We have to have a selection of minor clauses such that the major clause determines the predicate. And in every case, we have to have changing the major clause change the predicate value. No, I'm sorry. We have to change the value of the major clause. Excuse me. For correlated and restricted active clause coverage, changing the major clause has to change the value of the predicate. And for restricted active clause coverage, the minor clauses have to be held the same, which means for correlated active clause coverage, I have to change the major clause, changing that has to result in the, in the predicate changing but I don't have to hold the minor clauses the same, so I can change some of the minor clauses too in order to make the value of the predicate change. Professor, I'm sorry, going back to the last slide, uh, columns one and three on the table. Which slide There's are we on? Like, uh, yeah, the one you're on now, the one with okay. the table. It looks to me like columns one and three should be the same. Major cause or major clause determines p. Is that not the same as changing major clause changes p? It's subtly different, and and what I'm saying here, and I think it'll become clearer later with examples, which is why I like examples so much. In our starting point, we have to come up with a case where the major clause determines p. Now recall, we're going to have to have two tests, right? We need to have a test where the where the clause is true and a test where the clause is false. So one of those has to be set up such that the major clause determines P. So I'm gonna to need to find a pair of lines on my chart and one of those is gonna be my starting point. But for everything except restricted active clause coverage, for the other case, let's say I pick a row off that chart where my clause is true. And that's gonna be that's gonna be my starting test case. And I'm gonna look at that and I'm gonna say, yes, I can implement that. That's a feasible test case. So my clause is true, my, my major clause is true, my minor clauses are set to whatever they need to be in order to give me that pair. That's my starting point. And I can implement that test. Now I need a companion test where my major clause is false. Well, what do I have to pick? Well, I have to pick another row where my major clause changes value. And I have to pick for correlated or restricted, I have to pick another row where my predicate changes value. But if I'm not doing restricted active clause coverage, I could also pick one where I've changed minor values right, so minor clauses such that the predicate doesn't change. So it has to determine the clause for kind of my starting point test, but in order to go from true to false or from false to true, this is just telling me how much leeway I have and what else I can change along the way. Is that helpful? Um, Your answer is maybe a little, but not entirely. I guess I'm trying to, yeah, sorry. Um, 
Hmm. That's okay. Let's so let's that, go ahead that, forward into the examples. Okay, fair enough. Because I think that I think that's going to help a lot. Because this was a big, you know, this is a, this was a big sticking point for me too, and it took me a little while to really kind of get the get the idea of what was going on. All right. So what's our process when we want to do this? Um, when we want to do any either of these kinds of testing? Well, we want to select a major clause. And if we're doing full testing, we're going to iterate through and we're going to select each clause as the major clause one at a time. But we're going to select a major clause. We're going to determine the conditions for when the minor clauses allow the major clause to determine the predicate. Then for general active clause coverage, we're going to select any pair of conditions where when we change the value of the major clause, where we change the value of the major clause. The minor clauses don't have to change. They might, they don't have to. The predicate might change, might not, doesn't matter. For correlated, we're gonna select a pair where the major clause changes and the predicate changes. The minor clauses may or may not change. For restricted, which in a way, it's the hardest one to implement, but it's the easiest one to understand because I'm gonna pick the other Right, I'm going to pick the other case where the major clause changed, the minor clauses didn't change, the value of the predicate changed. So let's look at an example. Um, so here we've got, uh, okay, P equals A and B or not A and not B and C. Okay, whatever. It's, you know, arbitrary, arbitrary predicate. So we build up our truth table. We populate it, right, do this kind of binary countdown representation of the true false values. We go through the manual work of calculating what the predicate is gonna be in each case. And now we're selecting our major clause and hey, we're gonna select A as our major clause first. That's the one we're gonna look at right now. So we can use the XOR approach to determine when P or uh, when A determines the predicate. And so if we go through all this math, right, go through the logic, we'll find out that A determines the predicate when B is true or C is true. So here's that case. A determines the predicate when B is true or C is true. And we can see this, right? This is pretty straightforward to look at in this truth table because it's not too big. Um, where's the case where A changes value, nothing else changes value and the predicate or none of the other clauses change value and the predicate changes. Well, it's rows one and five, great. We can also see that that happens in rows two and six, where A changes value, B and C don't change value, and the predicate changes value. And we can also see that that happens in rows three and seven. But it does not happen in rows four and eight, because here we change the value of A, but the value of the predicate does not change. So we're going to cross these out. These are no longer good for our consideration because that's not a case where A determines the predicate. All right, so we're gonna knock them out. So this column shows us, this new rightmost column shows us where A determines the predicate. Now, first let's look at general active clause coverage. What do we require here? We have to pick rows where A determines the predicate and we have to pick rows where A changes. But we don't care whether the predicate changes, and we don't care whether the minor clauses change. So we can go back to this, and we can actually pick a lot of choices here, right? Because this is true for one and five, but it's also true for one and six, right? These are cases where A determines the predicate, and I changed the value of A, and the value of the predicate changed. And it's also true for one and seven. Um, Oh wait, I don't need the value of the predicates to change. This is GAC. I'm only changing, I need to change only P, excuse me, only A. I only need to change the major clause. Too many letters, right? And so one and seven, they're an okay pair here because I've changed the value of A. The value of the predicate didn't change, but for general active clause coverage, it doesn't need to. So 
I can then look at row two. Well, I can use row two and row five and row two and row six and row two and row seven. And I can use row three and five, three and six, three and seven. So I can take any one of these combinations and that will satisfy GAC. So now let me back up to the question you were answering or you were asking earlier when you said, it sounds like those two, those two columns in that table are the same thing. And now I'm hoping that you're seeing why that's not true because I can only pick from rows where A determines the predicate, but in GAC, I can pick from any of those rows where A determines the predicate. Now let's look at CAC, correlated active clause coverage. Now I have a new requirement. Now I need the, the, the value of the predicate to change. <clears throat> so I can use rows one and five, right? I changed A and the predicate changed. One and six. And I can no longer use rows one and seven because here I changed the value of A, the major clause, but the value of the predicate doesn't change. So I can't use that row anymore. That was okay for GAC for general active clause coverage, but it's not okay for correlated active clause coverage because the predicate didn't change. And I can look at two with five and six, and I can look at three with seven, but not three and five or three and six because the value of the predicate doesn't change. So I got a little bit more restrictive in the number of rows that I was allowed to pick from. Now, finally, we can look at restricted active clause coverage. And here I need all things to be satisfied. I have to determine the predicate, right? So that's gonna restrict the rows that I can use. The major clause has to change between the two test cases. The minor clauses have to stay the same between the two test cases. And the minor clauses, yeah, the minor clauses have to be the same. And changing the major clause has to change the predicate. Sorry, I read, I read them out of order. So for here, for rack coverage, that's just rows one and five, but not rows one and six or one and seven. And it's just rows two and six, but not two and five or two and seven. And it's just rows three and seven, not three and five or three and six, right? So we got a little more restricted about which pairs we could pick from. So I'm, hope you're, I'm hoping that you're seeing how that all went together. When we said that the major clause has to determine the predicate, that was just giving us a set of rows that we were allowed to pick from. So in this case, that knocked out rows four and eight because A didn't determine the predicate. But then I can pick from those rows in various ways, depending on whether I'm doing general, correlated, or restricted active clause coverage. Okay, so if we have active clause coverage where the major clause has to affect the predicate, that also implies that there's the opposite, inactive clause coverage. This is the opposite approach where the major clause does not determine the predicate. Um, so why bother? This seems like a pointless thing to do. It's actually not a pointless thing to do because there are certain circumstances where it's exactly the right thing to do. And that's particularly true in like safety interlocks or other kinds of safety critical things. So if we go back to our monster example again, you know, if the light is red and the valve is open, um, release the monster. Well, what about testing all the cases where I want to make sure I don't release the monster, right? I, I want to make sure that turning the light on and off by itself won't release the monster when the valve is closed. And I want to make sure that opening the valve by itself won't release the monster when the light is off, right? So it is a very useful testing approach, perhaps in more limited circumstances. So guess what? I have general and restricted inactive clause coverage here, and they work very, very similarly. And so here's the table, right? So I have to pick from cases where the major clause does not determine the predicate. 
and picking from those rows where the major clause does not determine the predicate, I have to, in both cases, change the major clause. I have to ensure that changing the major clause does not change the value of the predicate. And do I need to keep all the minor clauses the same? No for general, yes for restricted. We'll do a quick example here. Um, this is the same, uh, the same logic table, the same predicate that we were looking at earlier. Um, just to be interesting, we're gonna select C as our major clause. So we first want to determine the cases where C determines the predicate. And C determines the predicate here in rows seven and row eight. So for inactive clause coverage, I need to take those rows out. I can no longer choose those rows. For active clause coverage, those would be the only rows I could choose. But for inactive clause coverage, I may not choose those rows. I, I must not choose those rows. So where do I have general inactive clause coverage pairs? Well, here in rows one and two, I change the value of the major clause C and the value of the predicate doesn't change. Um, and then any one of these, any one of three and four or three and six and five and four and five and six, right? Any one of those combinations, I've changed the major clause, the value of the predicate hasn't changed. If I wanna look at restricted inactive clause coverage, then I have to hold the minor clauses the same. So I only have a few choices. I can pick rows one and two, or rows three and four, or rows five and six. Um, now, one thing I wanna go back and, and make clear here, when we're doing any of these, you know, you see these little bubbles here where I'm, where I'm giving possibilities. You don't need to do all three of these combinations to satisfy restricted inactive clause coverage or whichever clause coverage we're talking about. You only need to pick one pair and picking one pair will satisfy it for that, you know, for that major clause. All right, so we have infeasibility problems, just like every other test criterion. Um, for example, if A is greater than B is true and B is greater than C is true, then it's impossible to have C is greater than A, right? That's, that's an infeasible combination. And so just like we do with, um, with input space coverage or with, with graph criterion, we have to recognize those infeasible test requirements. However, in logic coverage, we normally do not try to um, you know, substitute somehow to make up for them like we would do in, in uh, input domain modeling. Instead, we're just gonna recognize that it's infeasible and we're going to ignore it. We're gonna throw it out of our test requirements. That can really be hard. Formally, formally, it's an undecidable process. It can be quite difficult to recognize when test requirements are infeasible. All right, and because we love subsumption, right? Everybody all together? Yes, we love subsumption. We've got our chart for today. This also means, hey, we're near the end of the lecture, thank goodness. Um, combinatorial clause coverage. Obviously you're testing all combinations. So naturally, if you test all combinations, you've covered every possible subset of combinations. So that subsumes all the others. Um, and if you're doing clause coverage or predicate coverage, you're at the bottom. You've subsumed most of the others, but you're not subsuming each other. And on the way down, we can find that restricted, restricted coverage subsumes general coverage, restricted subsumes correlated, correlated subsumes general, right? So the higher up we go, the more thorough our tests are, but also probably the more test cases and the more difficult they are to write and the more difficult it might be to find feasible test cases. All right, so quick summary. Predicates are usually simple almost almost always fewer than three clauses. As I said at the beginning, that's good because as you've now seen, more clauses makes it more complicated. So the fact that real software tends to have few clauses, that's good. If you've only got one clause, predicate coverage is sufficient. In fact, predicate coverage is 
identical to everything else. All you can do with one clause is see if it's true and see if it's false. When you've got a lot of clauses, combinatorial coverage might become impractical, um, but things like active clause coverage or inactive clause coverage could be practical to do. And if you're writing safety critical software um, and you will actually be doing some safety critical software testing in assignment number six, um, that often requires MCDC uh, modified condition decision coverage, um, which is usually considered to be the same as RAC, restricted active clause coverage. So you'll want to definitely get a little practice on your restricted active clause coverage because you'll be using that in uh, assignment number six. All right, that takes us to the end of the lecture.